we're live. Hello, everyone out there in Google Hangout land. My name is Michael Moyer. I'm a senior editor at Scientific American. And joining me today is David Friedman, uh, who's been a science, uh, environment, and technology writer for about three decades now. And um, we're talking today about a story that he wrote for our food issue, or special issue, which subscribers should be getting um, pretty much right now in the near future, and uh, which will be on newsstands maybe next week, I think. And he wrote this story, Are Engineered Foods Evil?, uh, which looks at, do that so you can see the nice art. Um, which looks at the controversy over genetically modified crops. So uh, welcome, David. Thanks for joining me today. Oh, it's a pleasure. Um, and I guess I'll just start um, by coming back to how the story came about. Um, we were looking for someone. We hear so much about um, the evils of genetically modified food. As you write in your article, there are 20 states now that have are considering um, regulations to limit the use of genetically modified food. Every so often, you hear about a study that comes out saying that it's terrible that everyone shares and everyone shares on their Facebook feed. But the science seemed a little murky, um, and so we asked you to, to look into it. Um, and I guess you can start by saying kind of how, how you started and, and what you found. Sure. So, uh, you know, let me start by saying, you know, honestly, this really wasn't a topic that I knew a ton about. Uh, and probably as much as the average reasonably well-educated layperson. So, uh, I, I thought in that case this would be a real advantage. Uh, and then I would go in uh, as unbiased as possible. I mean, I think everybody has some biases and there's no way to get around that. But uh, I didn't feel, I wasn't conscious of any strong biases whatsoever, uh, I would have been perfectly happy to go in and find out that uh, it turned out there's a lot of good evidence that genetically modified foods are horribly dangerous. I would have been perfectly happy to find out exactly the opposite. Uh, whatever it was going to be, it was going to be. The one thing I was really determined to do was to do my absolute best to represent both sides of the issue. Whatever the state of the art there is in terms of the scientific evidence, pro and con, I wanted to dig it up and present it in a fair light. So that was really my goal. Okay. Uh, and then what you found, what, what came out in um, what I saw and what you write in the, in the article, is that the field um, seems to be, even among scientists, uh, is somewhat divided in terms of personalities and people who are associated with one camp or another. That's right. And, and so uh, I don't think anyone needs me to tell them there's, there's a lot of polarization out there. There are people very, very sharply divided over this issue. Uh, I would say, roughly speaking, and this is a, a bit of a gross generalization, uh, the scientific community is pretty solidly pro uh, genetically modified food. That there are most people in the scientific community believe the evidence strongly favors there not being significant risks, different than the risks to ordinary food, uh, other non genetically modified foods. Whereas uh, people outside the scientific community, at least in the louder voices, are, uh, tend to be either very skeptical about it or, or even strongly against it. So again, a rough generalization, but, but that's the overall picture. Sure. And um, uh, as you say that, and as, as we go back to your, your background and, and coming in and trying to look at it with, a, um, with, with open eyes, um, we should, let's just clarify for our readers, um, uh, do you have any industry ties? Have you uh, been, you know, paid for work by Monsanto? Um, anything like that? Um, you know, uh, from when I approached you, I approached you as an editor approaches a journalist who's interested in these facts. Um, uh, but uh, just in case anyone has conspiracy conspiracy theories out there, why don't you just clarify your your, your position? Yeah, sure. So uh, no, I'm I'm strictly a journalist. Uh, the uh, I've never had any ties whatsoever to the food industry, other than talking to people in the food industry. Uh, I've been asked to uh, speak at food industry conferences. I almost always turn that down, and if I do, I pay my own expenses and won't accept any 
honoraria or anything else or gifts of any sort. So uh, I have no financial interest. Uh, I, I do sometimes get paid by uh, academic medical centers for uh, work related to health, uh, but I have nothing to do with the food industry. Great. And, and for our part at Scientific American, our editorial operations are totally independent and we're a bunch of um, cranky journalists who want to prove um, the, uh, everyone wrong all the time. Um, I, you know, we, we do sell advertisements in the magazine that is handled by our ad sales staff and is completely separated from us. I have no idea what they do over there. They don't tell me. I don't ask. Um, and uh, so we, and as, as much as we can make, we, maintain our independence, uh, our independent. Um, so anyway, just to get that out of the way. Um, so to get back to what we were talking about, you found that the vast majority of scientists uh, and, and scientific studies have come out saying that genetically modified foods are safe, that we have not found any adverse effects on human health to them. Um, so how then do you uh, explain things um, like the study, the French study that came out maybe last year that found uh, that genetically modified um, corn, I believe it was, created tumors in mice. Yeah, so uh, let me first say, uh, just uh, make sort of a little bit of a technical point here. Uh, you, you can't really prove something safe. So uh, most people don't, scientists don't claim that has, it has been proven safe. Uh, you know, technically what we say is, a lot of really concerted effort to try to find uh, problems and lack of safety have all failed. Uh, so there have been a handful of studies over the years that are very disturbing the, uh, and you mentioned one of them, the French study by Seralini, uh, and, and there are a handful of others that have found actually some, some pretty surprising and, and uh, as I say, disturbing results. Uh, typically animals get sickened. Uh, in that case it was cancer. Uh, there have been other problems of well, as well that have turned up in these studies. And I, I think to take a step back for a second, and, and this is something I wrote my last book about wrong, uh, in general, there are so many scientific studies being done on almost any question. Uh, many thousands are done about genetically modified food, for example. And there are so many ways that a study can screw up, if for no other reason just through statistical flukes, because so many are done. But in fact, there are many other ways to screw up a study. Yet you're always going to find some studies that take some side of an issue. Whatever it is you're looking for, you will find it in some scientific study. Uh, so if a handful of studies find that there's a problem with genetically modified food, but thousands find there are not, that I think most scientists agree is pretty good evidence there's probably absolutely nothing wrong with genetically modified food. And I think that's the stance most, most of them take. Now that doesn't mean we should dismiss these studies out of hand. And one of the things I point out in the article is that the scientific community possibly has not really been acting, has not been behaving as well as it should in really being a little more open-minded to some of the studies that have found uh, problems. And that they, they haven't always behaved really as scientists should in uh, being unbiased and weighing the evidence. Uh, there's been some evidence that scientists have gone out and, and tried to shut up people who speak out mm -hmm. against genetically modified food. And I think most scientists should agree that's not appropriate. That's not right. We should make sure that all scientists get voices, pro or con. Uh, this shouldn't be political. Science is a search for truth. I think the truth, at least from a scientific evidence point of view, comes out pretty clearly here. Uh, but to the extent that there are some disagreements, I mean, let's look at those. And I think in most cases you see that they're probably not credible. Well, when you have such a, a, a politically charged um, issue such as this, which should be adjudicated um, by scientists, by doing studies, by open-mindedness, um, it can be very difficult, I find, for scientists, especially when you feel like you're in the camp of overwhelming evidence, right? Um, and, and this was a, a part of the issue with climate change in the past uh, uh, decade or two. Um, if you have some result that comes out, some study uh, that says, oh, well, maybe, you know, there's some, there's some nuance here. We don't maybe think we understand this as well as we did. Um, it can be difficult if you're trying to control a message, 
right? And if there are people who are going to take that nuanced study and just blow it out of proportion one way or another to prove the political point that they want to prove. Um, and I see a lot of parallels here between um, genetically modified food studies and, for instance, climate change denial and uh, 15 years ago, um, the you know, vaccines and autism link. Um, and I was wondering if you, if you see parallels like that as well, if, if maybe there are, there are better ways to think about genetically modified food, if there are different ways to think about it. So I, I think parallels, and in this case the parallel to climate change is useful, but it, but it has limitations. So let's be aware there are some sharp differences as well. But yeah, I mean, one of the things you see, you know, and, and again I want to point this out, I mean, there's been some evidence of some misbehavior on the part of science in terms of trying to shut up people who publish studies that have some troubling results because some of those studies even though some of them have been found not credible there have been a few studies especially those that indicate there may be some environmental risks to certain genetically engineered crops uh... seem when like you say when you say environmental risks you mean um, not uh not environmental, like uh, the kind of environmental risk which would impact a person's health if they, if they live with a, a smoker or something like that. It's damage to the environment itself. Exactly, yeah, and, and typically to some of the fauna uh, around the areas of uh, where genetically modified crops are grown. So most studies have found there are not risks of that sort. Uh, again, different from those of any uh, traditionally bred crop. Uh, but but a few studies have found some, and the scientific community really acted very sharply to essentially try to get those scientists to shut up. That's not appropriate. We've seen that in the climate change community as well, where uh, scientists, uh, uh, some evidence has come out that there's been almost conspiracy among scientists to try to keep the message clear and to try to silence those who have a different message. I don't think scientists should ever do that. Uh, in my opinion, uh, science should be about uh, information transparency. Everybody gets a voice and you really just have to give the truth to the public and you hope the public will do the right thing with it. I mean, I think there's some evidence the public uh, has been somewhat misled on the question of genetically modified food. They're, they're not, in general, following what science has to say about it. but I don't think there's anything scientists can do about that. Scientists should not be politicians or advocates for the most part. Uh, it should be about getting the truth. I think the truth is fairly clear in this case. If the public doesn't take it, so be it. Um, let me go back to what you, you were saying uh, right uh, just a second ago where in some of the studies and the, the fauna uh, around where genetically modified crops were being uh, grown uh, suffered a little bit and it, it makes me realize that maybe um, we should clarify what we're talking about with genetically modified crops. What kind of crops are being grown right now that have been genetically modified? How have they been genetically modified? And, and why is this technology being pursued? The, the basic idea now for, for, I mean, as long as there's been life on Earth, uh, a, a very, you know, a primary aspect of the way life evolves is genes get scrambled from generation to generation. Uh, well, scientists have learned over the past few decades that they can pick and choose uh, how the genes get scrambled, and they can take individual genes and make changes, whereas the way it happens in nature or in traditional breeding, uh, there may be many hundreds uh, of genes that actually get scrambled. Uh, so we can be choosy about it, and as a result, we can actually develop crops that are hardier, that are grown with less water, that are more nutritious, uh, and then in every way you would want to improve a crop and, and ways in which farmers have been improving crops for thousands of years, uh, we can just do it a little more quickly and more effectively. Uh, so the question is, do these techniques cause problems and risks as well? And after uh, several decades of studying this question very, very closely, there's yet to be one single bit of clear, credible evidence that that's the case, that there are any special risks of genetically modified food. And this is an important point to say special risks because yes, there are always risks that when genes are scrambled something bad will happen, of course. We could get a toxin, there could be some disease related to it. We see this happen with our food supply. Foods go bad. 
but no one has ever shown that there are any special risks attached to genetically modified foods. The, there's the discomfort to me seems to stem in a way from the power of the technology and from the law of unintended consequences. That it was one thing when uh, 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 humans and farmers were out there and they would take two different types of tomatoes that look really good and crossbreed them and get a new type of tomato. Um, what people don't realize is that most of those experiments don't work and the tomatoes don't look good and the genes that get swapped aren't the genes that they want to have swapped. Um, and with genetically modified food you have this very precise uh, tool that allows you to go in right to the genome and do the thing you want it to do. Um, now, now some of the, the, the the argument against that being safer, uh, as you bring up in the article, is sometimes, you know, genes just don't fit in like a, like a key in a lock sometimes. They can go in sideways, they can go in upside down, they can have effects on the genes next to them, um, and, it's, uh, and it's one of these things where there could be unintended consequences at some point that using this very powerful technology will produce effects that we can't foresee and perhaps can't control. And I think that's absolutely true. And when you do sometimes hear pro-GM scientists saying, oh, it's incredibly simple, we know the gene, we know where it's going, we know everything it can do, I don't think that's a fair statement. And many scientists point this out. It's more complicated than that. Uh, yes, you, we absolutely can get surprises. We can control it to a certain extent, but surprises can happen. By the way, surprises can also happen and in fact are more likely to happen with traditional breeding. So either way, we can get surprises and that includes general, uh, genetically modified foods and these, uh, these surprises could in theory be very, very unpleasant. However, the controls against having an unpleasant surprise are actually much greater with genetically modified foods uh, because of the techniques they use. They are much, much more intensively tested and looked at than are traditional foods. So if a farmer does some cross-breeding, swaps around essentially randomly hundreds of genes, you don't know what you're getting. No one in the government is going to look at it. No one's going to test it. You find out when people get sick. If somebody in the genetic modification of crops labs does something like that, they have some idea what exactly they're swapping, and it's extensively tested uh, by scientists, by the government, and watched very, very closely before it's released to the public. So even though the risks, if anything, are less with genetically modified food, the, uh, the uh, testing of it is, is much greater. So in general, the chances of something go going wrong should, at least in theory, be much, much less for genetically modified food. So in a way, the opposition to genetically modified food um, is, is one of uh, a maybe a more deeper philosophical opposition to changing our food. Because if you're worried about something bad happening, well, um, you know, you, just, you can't eat um, uh, anything that's been changed by humans over the last 10,000 years, which means you really can't eat anything. Um, I, you know, maybe that's too strong of a way to put it, uh, but, it, you know, we have this idea of this, this, this pre-technological um, age in which everything was healthier and safer, um, and I think that that, uh, in, in many ways, is a naive fantasy. Um, and that, you know, certainly I don't want to argue that our diet as um, 21st century Americans is necessarily healthier than it was 100 years ago, um, but at the same time, that, that's not because of the specific uh, ge genetic modification technologies that we pursue. I think that's fair, and I don't want to dismiss uh, anyone's values or ideologies. Uh, and I, I think, as you say, there is factored into this as, as part of this, uh, of the objections to genetically modified food, there is an ideology that uh, that in many ways, uh, when things were more natural and less technological, especially with regard to food, that things were better. Uh, well, that's a that's a value judgment. I mean, that's essentially a story. Uh, people can believe it or not believe it. Um, uh, it's really not a scientific question. Science doesn't back that ideology up. It, it pretty much contradicts it. Uh, but again, if people want to believe that, I think that's fine, and, and they can pursue food supplies that way. I think for much of the world, genetically modified food can do a tremendous amount of good. 
I think most of the world sees that. Uh, most many governments see that. Uh, the population has a lot of concerns, but in general, it's a way of getting more food to people who don't get enough of it, of getting better food with climate change and a lot of climates becoming uh, not very uh, conducive to growing crops, increasingly so. Genetically modified food can really help there with poor farmers. Uh, it's a way of using less pesticide uh, and of growing foods more cheaply, especially when water is not abundant a lot of tremendous advantages. So let's separate the realities and the science from the ideology. Again, not to dismiss the ideology, but let's recognize it as such. Right, and I mean, we, we've spoken in the past about how, uh, you know, this is a different question, um, uh, uh, whether or not genetically modified foods are useful or beneficial, or whether or not you and I, as middle class uh, Americans, you know, living on the East Coast with a farmer's market down the street, should choose to buy genetically modified foods, or whether we should go and get our heirloom tomatoes, you know, we are in a pretty nice position to be able to make that choice. The question becomes, um, you know, if we shut this technology down in some way, how does that affect people all over the world and in developing countries? And you take us through some applications um, of genetically modified foods, which, which you know, we as Americans don't think about too often because we fortunately don't have the need for them. We think of genetically modified crops as being useful to big agribusiness um, because it helps them buy less pesticide and what have you. But maybe you could take us through um, how genetically modified crops are being used, used in the rest of the world. Yeah, and uh, and I think this idea of, uh, that you mentioned of uh, big agribusiness uh, and the role they play with genetically modified food has really been sort of front and center in a lot of the objection to genetically modified food. But as you, as you point out, in fact, uh, the biggest beneficiaries tend to be poor farmers and relatively poor and vulnerable populations in developing countries. Uh, for poor farmers, uh, they often simply can't afford to grow crops. They don't have enough access to water. Uh, they have to. They either can't get enough pesticide, or it makes them sick to work with it. Genetically modified foods can have natural pest resistance, and so you use less pesticides. So it's better for them and the environment. And in addition, uh, some crops have been genetically engineered to be more nutritious. Uh, I, I think one of the most striking examples has been the so-called golden rice which was a form of rice that was genetically engineered uh, to provide enough vitamin A uh, to uh, really counter the something like one million deaths a year due to shortages of, of vitamin A. So, uh, you know, this by all accounts really within science uh, seems to be a wonderful thing for the world but governments have been very, very, very slow to adopt it because of objections to it that aren't really based on science, uh, that are based more on ideology and often on a strong anti-corporate basis. And I'm, I'm no defender of big corporations. I mean, I, sure, there are problems with capitalism and big corporations, but I don't think we should let our biases against them stand in the way of foods that make people much, le much more well uh, getting out into poor and vulnerable populations. So, so you're saying it's possible to intellectually separate genetically modified technology from the companies that are developing it? Well, I can do it. Uh, I, I would think most people can. Uh, there seems to be reluctance to separate sort of anti-corporate bias uh, and ideological biases from the scientific evidence. Uh, and again, people uh, have a right to their biases. I don't dismiss them or even argue against them. I, I just point out uh, that the science does not back them up and in fact generally strongly contradicts them. Let me clarify also related to this something that you were just saying how in many cases it is um, it, uh, genetically modified crops are a great advantage to poor farmers. Um, they have to buy less pesticide, use less water, et cetera, et cetera. Now, is that even taking into account um, the money that it costs to license these seeds? You, you hear a lot about how you know you can't. A farmer buys a, a, a bag of seeds, genetically modified seeds from Monsanto. They have to pay a licensing fee, and then they have to keep buying the seeds every year. They just can't, you know, do what they would ordinarily do and, and take seeds from the crop that they grow. That's right, yes. And so there, there's been quite a lot of publicity about that. In the most extreme form, uh, there have been a lot of stories about farmers in India committing suicide 
because of what genetically modified uh, seed, uh, the way it's destroyed essentially uh, their business. Uh, uh, generally, completely untrue. Uh, these seeds are more expensive. Nobody is forced to buy them. This is an economic decision on the part of farmers. They can buy them or not buy them. It's up to them. They always have alternatives. Uh, most do decide to buy them and stay with them. It is true that they have to rebuy them every year. That's factored into the economic decision. The economics generally work beautifully for poor farmers. For poor farmers have really, without any question, been among the biggest beneficiaries of genetically modified food. And this is in developing countries among the most vulnerable populations. Uh, genetically modified crops have been a big boon to farmers. Um, that's great. Uh, it, you know, it, it's one of these things where you look at it as uh, the California um, proposition that came up last November, which was um, defeated um, somewhat narrowly. Uh, there are a number of other propositions. I believe Connecticut and Maine um, did propose to label genetically modified foods only if a certain number of other states. Um, also approved it, them, those two being small states. Um, I wonder what your position is on the issue of labeling genetically modified crops and um, the idea of, well, we should just be able to show people, people should know what's in their food. Uh, my feeling is this. If people want labels, they should get labels. It bothers me that the scientific community, the pro-GM science community, has really come out strongly against labeling. Uh, in my opinion, science should always be pro-information transparency. If people want that information, they should get that information. I have absolutely nothing against labeling. Uh, I don't need to see on a label whether or not it's genetically modified or not. Um, and frankly, I think if the population had a better understanding of genetically modified food, they wouldn't care either. But for whatever reasons, they do. Uh, I don't think science should fight labeling. Um, let's have labeling, sure. And, and let's continue. I think the scientific community should focus on continuing to educate the population to get past some of these ideologies, misconceptions, and biases so that the public at least understands that the scientific evidence strongly favors the safety of genetically modified food and the benefits that it delivers to the population, especially people who need it the most. See, here's where I disagree with you. I personally am against mandatory labeling for genetically modified foods for a number of reasons. One is that if people are really looking to avoid genetically modified foods, there is a, a federal label of, um, uh, I believe it's 100% organic that you can look for. That means it doesn't have any genetically modified food in it. Um, second, the, the very idea of putting a label on uh, it, it is, is a warning label, right? It says this contains genetically modified foods and the... It, it, implicit assumption then for the ordinary consumer is, oh boy, that means that it maybe um, this is bad for me and maybe I should do something else. You can look at the example of Europe, um, which required genetically modified foods um, back now, probably 15 years ago or so. Um, and very quickly, large food companies such as Nestle um, said, well, gosh, when we have these labels out there, people think that this is going to be something harmful and something bad, started to drop uh, genetically modified products from, from their foods um, so that they wouldn't have to put on the label. Um, people saw that as an admission that, yes, these are bad for them. Right. And now you have the situation which you have in Europe where basically the genetically modified crops don't exist. And yeah. as you point out in the article, that has global repercussions for governments in, uh, for example, Africa, who see, okay, Europe isn't doing this, why aren't they doing that? We shouldn't do it either. Yeah, and, and you're correctly pointing out that labeling actually has some bad effects, uh, and I agree, and I think it's really unfortunate that labeling will have some of these effects, and it will make the job even harder for the scientific community, but I also feel that just as I don't think the scientific community should ever be engaged in trying to hush up uh, any scientists who find otherwise. I also think the scientific community should not be on the side of hiding information from people who want it. Uh, even if the results are not really favorable and really aren't really good for the world, uh, I think science needs to really uh, be pro-information and, and never get in the way of people learning things. So it's unfortunate. It would have some uh, negative repercussions. That's too bad. But I, I personally don't think we should be uh, campaigning against labeling.
So on the moral side, you think that the the idea of having to put a label on a product, even though it will damage the um, uh, the ability of genetically modif genetic modification technology to be able to spread around the world and have these beneficial effects for poor farmers, for malnutrition, um, for the half million uh, children in the developing world who go blind every year because of vitamin A deficiency that so-called golden rice might be able to alleviate, that the uh, transparency argument trumps that. Essentially, yes, although you're putting the worst possible spin on it. Uh, I would put it differently, but yes, uh, I, I do agree that transparency trumps that. Uh, what I think it does is just raises the challenge to the scientific community. It could actually turn out to be a good thing in that it may promote uh, more intelligent discussion. Once we see more labels on these things, more people in the public start asking questions, it may be an opportunity for the scientific community to better state its case. And I think if they do and there's more discussion, in the end people will drift towards accepting genetically modified food, as I believe they really should, for the good of the world. Uh, as I've heard, um, if labeling is required in the US, one possible strategy for big food companies, General Mills and what have you, is to really tout that genetic, genetically modified ingredients on the, on the front and really try and make it a thing that you don't want to have your breakfast cereal without genetically modified ingredients because it's going to give you the extra stuff that, that you love. I well, guess uh, you can't do worse than what Europe did, so, so however it works. That's true. Well, good luck with that. Yeah, I think Europe has been a terrible role model for us in this. And uh, luckily, we're, we're doing better than Europe. We haven't been as silly and as damaging as they have been in many ways. And I, and I hope uh, Europe figures this out because, as you point out, in Africa and in many parts of the developing world, they look more to Europe than they do to us uh, for role models. So Europe has caused a lot of problems with this. Great. Well. David, I want to thank you for taking the time. We're about out of time here. Um, David Friedman, the author of Are Engineered Foods Evil? In the new September food issue of Scientific American, uh, our big single topic issue for the year, it should be on newsstands, if not now, soon. David, thank you so much for uh, taking the time today. Thank you. Really enjoyed it. All right. Thank you all for, uh, for joining us today.